You just can applaud that if you want to. I feel like that's a natural transition, right? Well, good morning, church. Good morning. Uh, I've told you before, this is my favorite day of the week. I love being able to come and uh, re-meet many of you. Sometimes you say, oh, we've met before. I say, all right, just give me your name one more time. I appreciate that. Um, you are a large congregation, and I, I love being able to engage with you. Um, and uh, let me just say, this, is, uh, this has um, been a blessing of the last month, kind of settling in, and many of you have asked, you know, how are you settling in? We are, we are absolutely loving it, my family and I. Cherie's always on the front row here. If you never meet her, she's, uh, she's right here. You can run up and talk to her after service, so get ready. Um, but uh, we, we, we've enjoyed it. We've loved it. Uh, we appreciate all of you who have made us feel welcome. And so I just want to say that on behalf of our family. Thank you uh, for what you've, uh, what you've done so far. And um, we, we appreciate all of you. So um, I think many times in life, <clears throat> maybe fewer for some, we have the opportunity to engage with or to meet or cross paths with someone that just exudes excitement and joy and love for Jesus. And I think for me, as I think back on my past and as I even went through uh, these specific cards, and this is just a small sampling of some of the cards that you filled out last week, the praises of how people have impacted your life, I can't help but be amazed at how God continues to work how he continues to engage and how he continues to use the body to lift up and to edify one another. For me specifically, I can remember uh, one instance. It was actually uh, several weeks before my freshman year of college when I was learning of who my roommate was going to be. And I, I met my roommate. We talked on the phone. Internet wasn't really that big at the time. And I remember engaging with him and talking with him a little bit about how he was going into ministry and how uh, he was, he was going to be a sophomore, so he'd been there a year, and, and kind of bringing me into how college life was going to look and learning the ropes a little bit. And as we talked and as we engaged, I, I, I realized this was going to be a relationship where we um, could continue to lift each other up, where we could continue to grow. And as the year started and as classes started, I found myself in conversations with him late at night talking about things I was going through in class and not just talking about things that I was learning head knowledge wise, but talking about things, how God was transforming and forming me in the process of learning and growing. It wasn't just about the theology of things, it was also about this personal application and growth that came from that. As we continued to talk and continued to move through that year, I realized that we were going to have a relationship that expanded beyond just school. Matter of fact, I I talk to him fairly regularly on the phone. He's a pastor up in northern Michigan now, and he's walked through some specific things with me, and I've walked through some with him. He's a a father, and he's he's a husband, and he's a a pastor there, like I said. And so a lot of ways I've learned uh, from him, and he's contributed to my life, and, and so on and so forth. And I've been blessed even to spend some holidays with him. We spend Christmas together from time to time, and we even spend these things called family vacations together. And that's not just our families, that's an extended family thing, because let me just let you in on this. He's actually my brother-in-law now. He married my sister, and I'm not a matchmaker. They actually knew each other before. That was kind of the reason why we ended up becoming roommates. But as we continue through life together, I am continued to be amazed and excited and impacted and filled with joy as I engage with him over time. His name is Marcelo, and he grew up in, uh, in Puerto Rico. He was born there, he was raised there, and up until he was about 16, 17 years old, he was planning on becoming a marine biologist. He was going to stay there on the island, he was going to study there, and then he was going to continue in this form of, of, of what his occupation was going to be. And one day God woke him up and said to him, I don't want you to be a fisher of fish, so to speak, but I want you to be a fisher of men. He wanted to call him into vocational ministry, and at that point, he realized his his plans, his life was going to change, and so from that moment on, he began to seek what the next thing was and realized that as he studied and as he he moved forward, God was opening doors for him. And at one point, uh, nearing the end of his senior year of high school, the door was open for some financial help for him to go to Indiana Wesleyan, where we went to, uh, to get our bachelor's degrees together. And as he went there, and as he learned, and as he grew, he realized God was calling him into a greater day, a larger day of ministry. 
And in all of those things, in every aspect, he was excited and he stepped into those things. And that was a thing that was contagious for those that were around him and continues to be to this day. He always had a heart for Puerto Rico, for where he was from. But at the same time, he was, he was willing to step into what God had for him. Many of you might have heard uh, in, on September 20th, 2017, a, a large storm, a hurricane hit the tiny island of Puerto Rico. And you might remember the damage and the devastation that you saw on the news and the things that happened, the way that things were wrecked. And I, I remember calling him a couple days after that storm took place. And I remember talking to him, and as he, he, he worked through the emotions that he was going through, he expressed to me the fact that he hadn't talked to his family yet. Because the power grid was knocked out, there was no wireless internet, there was, there was no cell service, and he was unable to even contact them to find out if they were okay. He didn't know if they were alive. He didn't know anything about what had happened in their realm, in their town. And then weeks later, as he got word that they were okay, that they were alive, their, their houses had been destroyed, but at, some, at the same time, they were still doing okay. He was on a plane as soon as the airports opened up to go down to visit and to help. And since that day, he's been down five different times. Now, he goes uh, periodically to be able to visit and to see family, but the biggest part of his reason for going now is the open opportunity to be able to share hope in a place where hope has been lost for many. Because as he goes to this place, he goes down there not with the desire to build. Now, he will do construction, he will build, he will help in those kinds of things, but his main goal there is to be the face of Jesus for people that don't have the opportunity or have lost hope in a lot of ways. Last year, even, I got to go with him on a trip. We both took students, and we went together, and he was our guide. And as we went, one of the things that I noticed is he's, he's a skilled craftsman. He can do a lot of things, and, and we built some, or we put some roofs on some houses, and we had a great time doing that. But his main uh, goal as he was there was to be the interpreter and to go and be the voice uh, in, in a lot of ways for people that, that, were, that were suffering from, from loss of family members or, or loss of property or both. And so as we need to go to the lumber store or to the hardware store or to pick up food or to get, you know, food from little places on the side of the road, he was always the one that would go and he was always the one that would engage. And as other uh, people that were on the trip would be loading up the truck, he would be talking to the store workers. He would be sharing love. He would be listening to their stories and talking them through and helping counsel them in some ways that they had not been able to process in the past. And as he saw that, I saw this, this sense of motivation change in him to, 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 to dig deeper. And it was the foundation from which he came was obviously from being in the presence of God and having that joy. But as he dug deeper, as he moved deeper into this, it was this outpouring of love and excitement that happened through the context of service and engagement with other people. And today we're going to talk about one serve. If you remember three weeks ago, if you were here, uh, we talked about one small, one big, one small, and one serve. We talked about this concept of how that, that, that as we move forward, our, kind of our philosophy will be to engage and, 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 to, and to be here in one big service on a consistent weekly basis to be able to, 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 um, to worship and to praise, uh, to praise God and to fellowship with one another. And then we talked about last week, one small, this, this, this idea of being together in a small group and doing life together communally and, and, and living and, 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 and celebrating together and mourning together and having this, this moment uh, on a weekly basis or even on a daily basis where we engage and we lift each other up. And today we're going to look at one serve. One serve is this context of saying, okay, we, uh, we have gifts, we have time, we have talent, we have treasure, we have abilities, and God has called us and he intends for us to use those to glorify him and, and, to, and to build up his kingdom. And so as we work through this idea of, of one serve, I want us to understand and to see a couple things. The first one is this, before we even get into it. Now, don't get me wrong, that we, it, it starts with grace through faith. There's, no, there's, there's nothing you can do, there's nothing I can do, there's nothing we can do to earn our salvation. And so within this, it's not about trying to serve so that we impress God or that we make him love us more. That's not the case. Instead, this is an outpouring, this is an understanding, this is a, this is a desire to be able to use and to share, to use our gifts and talents, to be able to share the gospel and to be able to invite other people into this joyous party. Matter of fact, Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 and 9 reads like this. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is a gift from God, not by works so that no one can boast. And verse 10 says, For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared us in advance. God prepared in advance for us to do. 
And the concept here is that, that through his grace, us receiving a gift, something we did not uh, in any way we can't earn and we don't, we, we don't deserve, his giving us his grace, and then us responding in faith and saying, yes, we will, we will allow you or I will allow you to be the Lord of my life. In that instance, that is where salvation comes from. However, the result of that becomes this outpouring of love and, and, and uh, service to others. Now, service is a natural response and outlet to what we, what we learn, but sometimes what happens is over time, or perhaps because we don't see the need, or because we're busy, this outlet kind of, kind of fizzles a little bit, or, or maybe the, the drain gets shut off a little bit, and we don't serve as much as we have in the past, or maybe we don't serve with, with the same fervent heart that we've seen or done before. And I think sometimes what happens is we get into this, this, this means or this, this, this place where somebody else will do it, or it's too hard, or we reach adversity, and at that point we kind of turn back or we stop. When in essence, what I want to say today, and what we're going to work through today, is this process of being motivated. This process of grasping and understanding motivation through our relationship with Jesus to be the hands and feet of Jesus in the world in which we live. Sometimes there's an issue in getting things jump-started, and today we're going to talk about what motivates. You may recall last week I asked you to fill out the connection line card, and then when you were done, take it by the welcome desk before you were done. And this is a small sampling of some of the cards that I received. Let me just say, I read through these two or three times this week, and I was, I was overwhelmed with excitement, and tears were brought to my eyes several times as I looked at how we as a church have been impacted by the, 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 the past generations. We've been impacted by family members, friends, people that have said yes to Jesus and were motivated to be the hands and feet. First one is, I praise God for my grandmother. Her spirit-filled prayers open my eyes to their power. Right there, I, I read that, she was, that, that this person was led by example. Be, it wasn't that she sat down and said, here's how you pray. It wasn't that she sat down and, and said, here's, here's the specific things you need to do. But it was because that her, her prayers were spirit-filled that that was something that was learned and, and then practiced. This person said they were, they were happy that, that, uh, that they, that they uh, or they praised God for their family, that they grew up with a firm faith foundation. They praised God for Martin for modeling a more nuanced, mature, resilient faith as I, as I uh, transitioned into adulthood. That is well put. This person said, I give thanks for James, a friend I made during graduate school, for showing me an example of a growing godly man, a worker, a husband, and a father, trusting in God's plan for his life. I still love those who weren't there as well. The big thought today is this, and if you're taking notes, it's in the inside. Thank you, my lovely assistant. <laughs> if you're taking notes, it's on the inside of, of your bulletin. The big thought is this, when it comes to Christian service, our primary motivation should be to serve Jesus. I think when we had this shift, this paradigm shift from it's not about the serving the people, but it's about, in essence, serving Jesus, it kind of shifts and changes the way that we are motivated, the means by which we are motivated, uh, the, 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 the clarity in which we are motivated, and, and the mirror in which it reflects. We're going to read from, from John chapter 12 today. And if you have your Bible with you, you can, you can turn to John chapter 12. Um, it'll be on the screen as well, and then at the same time, uh, if you're using a um, your phone or a smart device, whatever that looks like. Um, I'll give you a moment to, to find it, John chapter 12. But in this passage, it's situated between a couple of very important things in, in Jesus' ministry and Jesus' life. John was, was with Jesus, and this is his account of what happened in Jesus' life. And he was going from a place of basically miracles and teaching and, and, and sharing the gospel and showing, you know, talking about what he was going to do and showing love and mercy to people and, and all these things. And within this, this context, there's this transitional point where he finds himself at a, at a party that is thrown in his favor, that is thrown for him as a result of the previous chapter where he rose Lazarus, his friend, from the dead. Now, Lazarus had died. Jesus found out about it. He brought Lazarus back from the dead. And as a result, Mary and Martha say, we want, to, uh, we want to give you a party. We want to celebrate you. We want to celebrate this fruit in which we have been able to be engaged in. And then as soon as this is over, Jesus, he, he experiences what we know as the triumphal entry, and he starts into Jerusalem. And at that point, the rest of John talks about this, the process, uh, actually just a, a short few moments, the process in which he walks from the Last Supper to uh, the, the betrayal, to the trial, to the crucifixion, uh, to the resurrection, and then beyond. 
And so at this point, we see this transitional moment where we see Mary and Martha serving Jesus and in, in two very specific different ways. We're going to pick up in verse 3, and we're going to read some. We're going to come back and forth on it. Uh, I know the slides might be a little bit messed up. I apologize for that, uh, for how this is going to look. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to read a few verses, and then we're going we're to parse those and look at them, and then we'll keep coming back to it. So keep your, uh, keep your thumb in the, in the page if you're going to uh, follow along. Verse 1 says, Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. Now at this point, I want to pause. This is the moment of service. This is when the the, the service took place. And this is what sprung forth a huge response from, from both the disciples and from Jesus. This is six days before Passover, probably uh, starting one of, the, one of, if not the greatest form of service ever, the greatest act of service, which was Jesus giving his life for us. And then at that point uh, beforehand, Jesus in verse 2, he's been served by Martha. But at the same time, Mary steps in and says, okay, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do something. I'm going to serve you in a way that you've probably not experienced before. I'm going to anoint you. I'm going I'm to do something as you walk to this place of the cross, which she didn't know what she was doing. She just felt led to do it and step forward in obedience. And I'm going to give you everything that I have. Now, let me just say, Mary poured out the perfume on Jesus' feet. And for me, my response is different than what we're going to hear from Judas. Mine isn't about a frustration with the money. Mine is more about the mess that happened. Like, I, I'm not a, I, don't, I don't love messes. And so at this point, as, 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 he's pour, as she's pouring out this, this, this perfume on Jesus, and some of you are smiling, you're like, yeah, I would not have enjoyed that either uh, for, this, for this to happen. But it, the action in and of itself was her, was her obedience and her stepping out and saying, okay, I'm going to serve humbly and give all that I have. And at the same time, even as she lets her hair down, let me just say, this was, this was something that was, was difficult for them to swallow at that time as well. Because you didn't, in that time as a woman, you didn't let your hair down in public. And so as she did that, she basically was saying, I'm humbly serving my master in a way where I'm, I'm, I'm willing to give away everything to say yes to glorifying him. So let's examine this for a moment. The first thing is this, this act originated as a response to Christ's action. The party was given because Jesus started it all by, by raising Lazarus from the dead. Jesus is the originator. Jesus is the one that started all this. And God, as he created the earth, created us in turn to worship him. What we do when we worship even here on Sunday morning is a reflection of what he has done for us. It's a response of what he's already done in our lives. That is the purpose of what worship is for. Christian service is a form of worship. Some of you might work in jobs or places where when something happens, somebody else's response might be, that's not my department. Anybody ever heard this before? Anybody ever said it? I see you in the back. I see those hands. No. So I think sometimes, and I've worked in settings where I've heard this actually before, I think sometimes what happens when, when, we, when we hear the words, that's not my department, is this, this direct reflection to say, okay, I'm not going to help out in that area. That's not something that I'm called to do. That's not something that I'm fit to do. That's not something I had the time for. When in essence, a lot of times uh, when, we, when we look at ministry in and of itself, it is an opportunity that's, that takes place in a place where it's never really convenient. I had uh, uh, the pleasure of, of working with and the blessing of working with uh, somebody at a, at a place where I previously served who they, they took their job of service seriously. And by that, what I mean is she was in charge of operations and, and she had the job of kind of putting together uh, all the, the things that, that have to do with running the, the facility at the church and all of those types of things. And one of the things that I realized and one of the things that I saw in her that it went far beyond, quote, her job description to serve the church. I found that if there was trash somewhere in the hallway or outside the building, she was the first one to go and to pick those things up and to humbly say, you know what? It doesn't matter you know, if I put this here or where it came from. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick these things up because this is what uh, I, I want to do to, to serve the kingdom. Or maybe she had to stay late some nights because there were people that wanted to use the building, and she did so because she, she loved the church and wanted to see people know and grow in Jesus. 
Never from her lips or from her attitude did anyone ever hear, that's not my department. Instead, it was always, yes, God, I will serve you and however I can. And Mary's actions here were originated from the response of Christ's actions, just the same. He never says, no, I'm only doing this for a select amount of people. I'm only doing this for a select amount of time. No, Christ goes, he supersedes all of that, and his sacrifice is for everyone for all time. And that is the reflection of what our service should look like. The second thing that, that we can look at from this as we, as we kind of explore and examine her act of service is it was a selfless act that anointed Jesus. It was selfless. It was humble. She gave what she had. Let me just say, I think sometimes, is it really selfless? Is it, is it selfless or sacrificial giving if, if we can afford it? I think for her in this case, it probably was something that she really couldn't afford, but she stepped forward in it because she realized that that was the best way to be able to serve her God, and she humbly said yes. After uh, our, some of our services uh, at, at, uh, at, at, at our youth ministry where I previously served, one of the things that, that the student leadership team would do is they would go around and they would stack up all the chairs. And that sidebar right here, if you're looking for a place to serve and you're, you can stack chairs like after service today, the ushers would welcome you to stay and to stack chairs afterwards. Yes, somebody in the back is saying hallelujah. That is... But they, they would all stack the chairs and they would put them away and they would get them ready. And, and about the same time when our youth ministry would let out, the children's ministry would let out as well. And so my kids would come running over to the side where I was serving. And as they would get there, uh, they, would, they, would, they would jump into, you know, conversation with some of the older kids. And my daughter, if you know her, she's, she's 10 going on uh, 17. And so she would jump right in there and she want to talk. And my younger boys, they'd play a little bit. But my youngest boy, he's four. And I, I'll, I'll tell you this, I, I'm trying to use some, some personal illustrations because I want you to know a little bit about our family. I want you to get to know us a little bit. And one of the things that I noticed from him early on as, as he started to be able to identify what was happening is that he wanted to be part of the action. He wanted to be part of the service. And so as the students were lifting, he realized at four years old that he wasn't really big enough or strong enough to be able to lift the chairs. And my wife tells me this, I didn't actually see it, but she said she watched him as the wheels turned and he looked around the, the, the gym floor and he realized there was trash on the floor. There had been cups that were left by the kids. There was, you know, there was pen caps and there, was, there, were, uh, you know, there were handouts there that, that didn't get filled out. Uh, there was you know, bulletins there. There was other, those kinds of things. And she said she watched him as he walked around and he picked up all these trash items. And he took them and he put them in the trash can. And then as he came back and the students were still putting chairs away, he saw the pens laying around and he picked up all the pens and he, he put them in the receptacle for the ones that didn't get put away for that night. And as he, as he looked around, he looked for other ways that he could help and he could contribute for his size and his age. And it wasn't that we asked him in any way, he did that out of his own heart, but what he did is he saw an avenue in which he could serve, a place where his gifts and his skill set could be used. He wasn't discouraged because he couldn't do what everybody else was doing. Instead, he said, yes, I'll find something that I can do to contribute. And I think right here what we see is that she wasn't, Mary wasn't the richest person. She didn't have everything together. She wasn't the best, you know, the, the, the model person to be serving. But what she did do is she gave in a way sacrificially where she could contribute to the Savior, to the kingdom. And for me, being able to see that and read that, I, I try to find ways in the understanding of how can I step forward and give in a way that's honoring to him in which he has prepared me and, and empowered me to do so. And the third thing is this, the act of service edifies the body. This act of service edifies the body. Her service brought a sweet aroma to that room. Her service brought a, 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 an aroma where everybody could enjoy it and, and be uplifted together through the body of Christ. You know, I look at mission trips sometimes, and I think um, in a lot of ways, short-term mission trips can be a great way for service and learning. And even this mission trip that's coming up for Haiti, I know that it's going to be a great thing as I talk to Scott about his philosophy of short-term missions. And I look forward to hearing from the Honduras team of the students that went uh, several weeks ago as they're, they're going to share here in the coming weeks. And the one thing that I, I'm most excited about those is when, when the students or when the people that go on these trips come back on fire and ready to be able to be kind of a spark for those that are around them. Matter of fact, a lot of times with, with groups that I take or I have taken in the past, I like it to be a smaller group so they can grow together and they can be a close-knit group and where they can learn. And then when they come back, they can be a burning fire that spreads so that more people get the vision and, and can move forward in that service and understanding. Not everybody has to go on the trip. 
But as, as, as things happen, as people move, and as people are impacted, that can be something that's contagious, where others can continue to grow and be part of it, and be part of what God wants to do as well. One more thing we can learn from this is that a true act of Christian service is facilitated in a worshipful heart by anointing the feet of Jesus. It's about a posture. It's about a place. A true act of Christian service is facilitated in a worshipful heart, the reflection of what God's done by anointing the feet of Jesus. It's a result of our encounter with grace, which leads us to an outpouring with love. I praise God for my wife and her family who showed that God is everywhere, and closer than I thought before. I praise God for my grandmother's Christian life. She was a big influence on me growing up. I praise God for Brad, who brought me to Christ Community Wesleyan Church. You know, as I see these and I read these, I'm encouraged by people who stepped forward and made an impact. Let's jump back to the passage. Verse 4 through 6 is Judas's response to this act of selfish, the selfless service. Verse 4 says, But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It It was worth a year's wages. He did not say this because he cared about a poor about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Let me just make a note: Matthew and Mark both also record this story. And the response that occurs as soon as this is over is Judas leaves and he goes and betrays, goes right to the religious leaders and he betrays Jesus. And that, and that, that point makes me think this is kind of the straw that broke the camel's back. But at the same time, I realized that the agenda that he had was one that realized that Jesus was not going to fall into the plans that he had. And instead, he wasn't going to be able to, to twist his arm or bend him in the way that he wanted him to go. And so at that point, he turned his back on him. And the big point here is this, ulterior motives in Christian service often steer servants away from the face of Jesus. When we serve without first having a heart of Christ, or without allowing him to be the one that steers us and shows us the way, when we step into it, a lot of times that can steer us away from what God might have for us. Judas objected, which in a lot of ways, it makes me laugh out loud because this is obviously, if Judas objects, then we probably is what we should do if he's the, 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 the adversary in the whole thing. But also his greed, he wanted more money so that he could steal from it. Here's the thing, as I, as I look at statistics for the church, a lot of times people will list reasons why they might not come to a church service or be part of a church body. And the overwhelming majority, and a lot of times when you look at these specific statistics, is that people won't come because of Christians. Now let me just say, people are, are, are imperfect, P- people are people. And, and within that, obviously, there's, there's instances where, where we're going to make mistakes and we're going we're gonna to fail those that are around us. But I think uh, the big key, the goal here, kind of leads back to this understanding, this process of wanting to be more like Jesus in all that we say and all that we do. I'm going to imagine in this service, I'm going to have a larger response with this question. How many of you this past week uh, experienced or saw um, this, this new popularized app called the Face app? Anybody in here? Okay, it is more. Good. It was only four in the first service. I almost skipped this point. <laughs> but basically, this app is, uh, is, is set up so that you take a picture of yourself, and then the app will either age you to show what you will look like in the future, or it will show you what you used to look like, maybe to make you cry. I don't know. I didn't, I didn't engage in it. I have not done it. Um, and part of the reason is I didn't want Russia to, to, uh, to own my, my name and my, my likeness. But no, I'm just kidding. Maybe, I don't know. I don't, maybe I'm not kidding, I don't know. But I think one of the interesting things about this is, it, is it's kind of symbolic of our culture. Because as I look around this room and I looked around first service and I see our culture even now today, there is, there's a lot of wisdom in this room. There are a lot of years lived. There's a lot of people in here that have, have done life and they know what it looks like to live a long time in the Christian faith and to know Jesus. But the problem with this app is that it, it, it kind of pushes us forward in this understanding and this, this idea of being part of this microwave culture where we want everything right away. And I'm not saying that the app is bad. I think it's kind of clever and funny. But what I'm saying is that sometimes this kind of points toward this idea that we want to be a place where we have the wisdom and the understanding and the knowledge. We want to be in this place where we've arrived, so to speak, and we want to skip all the hard times and the things that are in between where God wants to teach us. 
And so the problem that we run into when we, when we attempt to live in a life when, and, and we attempt to subscribe to a microwave culture is we lose out and we miss the opportunity to be able to walk through the places, the trials, the things that God wants to teach us along the way that bring us to a place where we can look distinguished. And then, let me just say, most of the time in the pictures, it's either no hair or gray hair, which that's, that's what happens. But there's a reason for that. That's, that's the wisdom that comes. And so as I look at that specific passage, look at that specific thing, the authentic wisdom, the change takes time. And it takes sub- sub- subscribing to Jesus' plan moving forward rather than doing our own thing or wanting it on our own time or having it the way that we want it to be. I think we can also look at that passage and we can learn that service or actions facilitated without a heart desiring to serve and to worship Jesus are done in vain. 1 Peter 1.12 says, It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you. And actually, serving Jesus circles back to this posture of worship, a response to what he's done. You probably have seen before that celebrities, a lot of times, will, will put on these humanitarian efforts to help with natural disasters or help with people around the world. And a lot of times, those are good. And I'm not saying they're a bad thing. I think it's, it's good to, to, have, to be good humanitarians and to have uh, you know, a, a serving hand around the world and even in our own culture and our own uh, climate as well. But the problem is, a lot of times, those things don't yield a lot of fruit because they're not uh, a, a direct reflection or an in any way coming from having a relationship with Jesus. And so while houses might be built and bellies might be filled and people might feel good and, and, and brought together, there's no real change that happens, which is, which is the cycle that's being brought back, which we use the means of being able to help people with tangible physical things to help them to see Jesus. That key part is missing when we have ulterior motives and when our desire is not to be worshipful towards Jesus. I'm thankful I praise God for Sarah who helped me get through my freshman year of college and helped me connect to the Christian ministries there. My prayer for this one is that that continues to happen, especially on OU's campus for the new freshmen coming in. I praise God that that he worked through my friends and family to help me work through financial changes. These changes and the help revealed to me a purpose for my life and and to better serve God and to be more faithful and obedient. Verse 7 and 8, we'll get back to the passage if you're there. Verse 7 and 8 reads like this. This is Jesus' response to Judas. Leave her alone, Jesus replied. It was intended that she would save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. Jesus rebuked Judas said, this isn't necessarily a waste of time, but the the goal is this, the main priority is this, to serve me. And in so doing, you will serve the people that are around you. This is about a motive and the primary priority. In your note guide, it says this for verse 9, the presence of Jesus is attractive and is often encountered through the fruit generated by Christian service. The presence of Jesus is attractive and is often encountered through the fruit generated generated by Christian service. We're going to hash this out in a minute. Verse 9 says, Meanwhile, a large crowd of Jews found out that Jesus was there and came, not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. They wanted to see, they wanted to experience this fruit that Jesus had done by bringing Lazarus back from the dead. And in so doing, they would come into the presence of Jesus. Acts 1.8 says this, but you will receive power when you, when you receive the Holy Spirit who comes to you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Global Partners, the, 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 the missions wing of the Wesleyan Church, their amplified purpose is one that looks just like this, that takes this verse and attempts to apply it today. It looks like this. We, we, we thrive and we attempt to serve the here, the near, the far, and the heart. And by that, what they mean is the same kind of concept from Acts 1.8 is that we want to serve here, the people that are around us, within our own community, within our own families, within our own homes. We want to serve the near, the people outside of that, maybe in this region or even in this country. We want to serve the far in other countries. We want to serve the hard, maybe the people that are hardened towards the gospel. 
And within that concept, we see, I can illustrate here, that the here a lot of times gets, uh, gets relaxed. And we almost say, okay, well, you know, if I, if I take, and working in, in next-gen ministries is difficult sometimes when you can't work with, alongside the families. What we do is we, we take the, the, the responsibility of service and we, we kind of almost relegate or we give it over to the, the, the church. We say, okay, here's, here's my child or here's my grandchild. Can you please speak into their life? Can you ch- please change them? When in essence, what Jesus is saying here is this, is that as we encounter Jesus, as we encounter him, as we encounter his miracles, as we move forward, that is an opportunity to be able to grow. And the goal here, the understanding is that when we do that, we embrace that, we live that, and even as we read in these cards, we impact the people within our own sphere of influence. Maybe something else from that specific passage, spiritual fruit is a byproduct of Jesus' presence. For works do not save us, but are instead an outcome of our relationship with him. If you believe in Jesus, the outcome will be Christian service. If you engage in a relationship with Jesus, there's n- it's, it's nearly impossible to be able to, 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 to hold that in or to keep it for yourself. You will want to share it with others. Verse 10 and 11 rounds out this passage. It reads like this. So the chief priests made plans to kill Lazarus as well. For on account of him, many of the Jews were going over to Jesus and believing in him. And and just as we said several weeks ago, as I talked a little bit about service to begin with, when you uh, submit to Christ, when you begin to take steps forward, there's going to be a target on your back, so to speak. There's going to be resistance. That's not the end. That's not the stopping point. That's the motivation to continue to move forward because that's when you know that you're being used of Jesus. I praise God that when I had surgery, the ladies from the church got together and mailed me a packet underlined of encouraging cards, probably at least 30, pouring out their love and support to me. I praise God for older adults who walked and led the Christian life with humility. I praise God for my student union director who had a huge influence on my journey to God while I was in college. The subheading there is this, the desire of a heart of service. What I want to do, and don't check out on me, we're going to read just four more verses from Luke. This is a a similar passage of this engagement that Jesus had with Mary and Martha. But I want us to not get lost on, on, on all the expectations and things that happen. But I want, you, I want us to, to pour into and to really focus on Mary's posture. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he had said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. 41, Martha, Martha, the Lord answered. You are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. From the first passage in John, we learn a heart of service motivates action. Action renders fruit, and fruit attracts attention for, those, for the one whose heart the servant loves. Let me just say this. This is a cycle, and I was going to put uh, that on the bulletin to kind of draw. I'm not a very good artist, so I didn't do it. But here's, here's the deal. A heart of service motivates action, right? That action then renders fruit. Once you serve in the Holy Spirit, it renders fruit. So you come around the cycle. Once that fruit uh, is, is seen, it is attractive, and it brings people into the presence of Jesus. And when they encounter the presence of Jesus, they'll never be the same, and they come to a place where they want to share, and the cycle then continues. Jesus wants to use us. Now that second passage in Mark, excuse me, in Luke, looks like this. When it comes to Christian service, only one thing is needed, to rest in the presence of Jesus. The band's going to come back up, and we're going to close in a reflection time. And as they come, I want to I kind of circle back to that illustration that I started with about my brother-in-law, Marcelo, and about the motivation that he had and the way that he was changed when he embraced the way that his home looked after that storm. 
You know, he went back home after he saw the pictures and he saw the, 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 the wreckage. He saw the way that, that everything that he knew growing up, his school and his church and his home and his neighborhood had been destroyed. He looked where trees used to be and homes used to be and even where right down the street from him where there was a Christian academy used to be and all of those things had been destroyed and ruined and wrecked and were gone. And as he looked at those things and he saw the devastation, he was moved in a way where he said, I want to step in. I want to help not just by building, but also by sharing hope in Jesus. And as he took forth and he did that, I I, I went and I saw the same thing. I walked the same streets and I tried to picture what it used to look like. And at the same time, I was embraced by this thought of what if it, what, what would it look like if I returned home after being gone for a while? And as I walked back into the neighborhood in which I grew up in, the place where people poured into me, the place where my family and my church had loved me and supported me, what if I walked back and everything had been destroyed, everything had been ruined? And then I thought to myself, and as I think about the culture that we live in, that there isn't necessarily physical uh, destruction that has occurred around here. It isn't like we've, we've, we've had to suffer a bunch of storms, uh, physical storms or, or terrible things. But I will say this, while we might not be in a place of physical destruction, we are living in a place of spiritual destruction. And so the motivation in which we have by living in the presence of Jesus can easily be expanded and and worked upon by the fact that we know that the place, the culture in which we live is, 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 is dying in hope and has no grasp on the love that we get to experience. And so the motivation that we have moving forward is less about this, oh, let's go build a roof although that is an admirable thing and gives us opportunity to be able to share, but it's more about this opportunity to be able to serve through being the hands and the feet and the mouthpiece of Jesus in the here and the near and the far and the hard. I praise God for Scott who fruitfully followed Christ in all areas of his life. I praise God for my spouse and daughters for their encouragement and patience during my conversion and journey with Christ. I praise God for my family and raising me in a way that I want to serve him and the church. In a moment as we sing, and we spend a time of reflection and response, I can't help but think about the question of the people in my own life and the praises here. What if these people had said no? Today, the reflection moment looks like this. What what, what person is God putting in front of your face? What, what people is he saying, here are the ones that I want you to serve and I want you to share the gospel with? What treasures and talents do I have, do you have, that God wants to use? What time and energy does he want us to be uh, placing before his, him and anointing his feet with? Maybe what opportunities of service are there? How can you find those? And possibly maybe just this. Maybe today is a moment where we need to begin to rest in his presence, in the presence of God, and allow him to point the way. As we sing this song, I encourage you to reflect and to be open to how God might be calling you to step forward, or maybe how he might be asking you to sit and rest. I believe in the concept of seasons in life and how he calls us to different seasons, and I pray that you would be open and hear and respond to how he might